Hello, Fairly Secret Music. Uh, I guess I'm Fairly Secret Music, so I don't know why I say hello to myself. Uh, hello, viewers. Uh, <laughs> I'm David. Uh, I decided today I was going to uh, talk about one of the bands that I've been into the longest, and that would be Fate's Warning. Uh, Fate's Warning are a band from Connecticut, and... Uh, they're a five-piece, uh, two guitarists, bass player, drummer, singer. Uh, the original singer's name was John Arch, and uh, Jim Mateos, or Matheos, I don't know how you pronounce it really, um, guitarist. Uh, their first guitarist was a guy named Victor Arduini. Yeah. Uh, Joe, Joe DiBiase on bass and uh, Steve Zimmerman on drums. Uh, this first album kind of reminded me when I first heard it, kind of reminded me more of Iron Maiden. Uh, Fate's Warning are a band that I think unjustly get compared to Queensryche because I don't hear the comparison at all. Um, I think the earlier stuff sounded more like uh, having a... a an Iron Maiden influence more than Queensryche. Uh, this first album is is pretty good for a a debut album. It has some pretty decent uh, songs on it. Let me uh, do this. Uh, Kiss of Death was was a nice one. Uh, Night on Brocken. I love that. That's the song that he's, they, they do the outro and he sings, You, you're the one I saw in flight on Walpurgis night. I always liked that line. Uh, probably the best indication of kind of what they were going to do the next album is the song Damnation. And when I saw them on the Perfect Symmetry tour opening up for Sanctuary, uh, in Minneapolis, they did Damnation, and I remember standing there thinking, man, Ray, you have this crowd in the palm of your hand. It, everybody was super quiet and, and really respectful during that portion, the really mellow portion of the, the song. And uh, the funny thing is that I said they were more in line with Iron Maiden as an influence, and one of the bonus tracks is a rehearsal from 83 of them playing Flight of Icarus. So that goes to show you that they weren't just a Queensrake style band. Sorry about this. I didn't have it set up quite as right as I usually do. Um... Their second album is Spectre Within, and it's the same lineup on this album, but their uh, playing and songwriting just went up a notch or seven on this album. You have Traveler in Time, Orphan Gypsy, uh, Without a Trace, um... Pirates of the Underground, I'll just go through them. The Apparition, Kyrie Eleison, and Epitaph. Epitaph is majestic. Uh, the Apparition and Pirates of the Underground were probably my two favorite songs on here. Um, this, along with the first album, I'm not quite as familiar with. Um, just because I gravitate towards the Ray Alder stuff a little bit more and the last John Arch album. Um, they did have a song, Kyrie Eleison was on the River's Edge soundtrack, I believe, and that was a movie with Crispin Glover and Ione Skye. Um, I think Metal Blade actually did that whole soundtrack. Um, this is kind of where you see the band taking form uh, kind of finding their own sound um, and 
really not sounding like other people, but John Arch's voice started getting kind of higher and higher as time went on. And by the time he did his last album with them, Awaken the Guardian, holy crap, he was doing super high stuff. Um, lots of, of vocal layering, um, which sometimes I, I think it, for a band that I know tours, uh, I think that can be a hindrance because then it doesn't sound like the studio album. But on the other part of me says, do whatever you want in the studio. You don't have to re reproduce things 100%. Uh, Fata Morgana is just an amazing song. And there are so many difficult vocal parts on this song. Um, I cannot believe he was still able to sing these songs uh, almost 30 years after the fact, because this album came out in 1986. Um, the Sorceress is about witch hunts. Uh, Valley of the, of the Dolls has one of my favorite lines in it. It is... Uh, Blasphemous black Bibles bias you, betray bigotry, slay the hydra, burn the talisman. And then he sings Holocaust and then goes, ah. And I always thought he should have just said, Holocaust. And, and just kind of like kept that word going. But it was, it was just weird. Some of his choices were just odd to me um i know some of the things he did are things that i would never do or i wouldn't think of doing um but they were so unique and so good and it was, it was almost a shame that this was his last album and then he didn't do anything until um like 2003 he did two songs um they also had a song on here called Giant's Lore, The Heart of Winter, which was based on a, uh, um, oh God, what's the, the guy who wrote Dorian Gray, um, Oscar Wilde story about a giant that locks these children out of his, uh, garden and says, you cannot play here and whatever. Um, whoops, I just dropped a CD. Uh, this is actually the two disc thing that came in a slip case. I didn't like the DVD for some reason, so I sold that and the original CD. And I really regret doing that. That's kind of stupid of me, but that was back in like, like 12 years ago. Uh, so after that album, they did an album called No Exit. And this was kind of a shift in the sound uh it got a little thrashier at times but this has like a 22 minute song called ivory gate of dreams which if you're gonna do a 22 minute song honestly this is the song that i have uh kind of compared everything against because there is no point in this song where it seems like it's lagging or anything. Uh, it, it has so many different kind of moods and tells a story about, you know, the ivory gate of dreams and the kind of like a dream world. Uh, but it's also about, you know, the, the very last line in it is uh, hope leads to quiet desperation when reality obscures your dreams, m makes the mind a grave of memories that wander like the lonely breeze whose whispers echo through ruins rust of towers torn and dreams that turn to dust. And every time I listen to that, I'm just like, whoa, that's, that's depressing shit. Uh, but it makes me happy. Um, the funny thing about this album is I had only heard 
stuff with uh, John Arch. And I was never a real big Iron Maiden fan. Uh, I, I liked them. I thought they were okay. But one day I decided I was going to get... Uh, it was either... Let me see. It was either... Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. Let me find out which one came out. I don't remember which one came out. I think it, I think it was going to be se uh, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. So I had a choice at the record store. To either buy Seventh Son of a Seventh Son or this new album by Fate's Warning that just had come out. They had, I think they had both just had, just, just had come out. Sorry about that. Um, and just at the last minute, I decided to go with Fate's Warning. I didn't know what their singer really sounded like. I knew he was kind of a higher, like, register singer. Um, I didn't know that they had switched singers. All I knew is that they were on Metal Blade. And I was listening to Lizzie Borden by that time, probably. I'm not even sure who I was listening to. Uh, this came out in 88. So, yeah, I was probably listening to Lizzie Borden. Uh, so I gave him a shot. And after No Exit, the title track, which is a little kind of interlude song at the beginning, kind of like a prelude, uh, they go into Anarchy Divine. And I loved the music right off the bat. And a lot of the times I would buy CDs or cassettes by bands and not really know what they were going to sound like. And you're always like sitting there crossing your fingers that you're going to like the singer. And Ray comes out of the gate doing the, the, I'm done kind of, <laughs> I can't even hit that note anymore. Um, and uh, just a huge smile came across my face. Uh, I remember we were going through the through a drive through like probably at a McDonald's or something like that, and I was sitting in the back seat or sitting in the passenger seat, and I was just so giddy. I was so happy that I loved the singer. And, you know, then it went into silent cries and in a word, which kind of go together. Uh, for a long time, Shades of Heavenly Death was my least favorite song on here. I don't think I have a least favorite song, except for maybe the No Exit prelude thing. Um, this so this album is pretty much 100% awesome. Uh, and you don't get that a lot until you uh, listen to their next album, which, holy shit, this was... This was metal on a whole new plane just amazing this came out in 1989 uh so i had already started playing drums for about a year at this point let me make this a little easier to read and uh i remember bringing this to my drum teacher uh scott metko and he listened to the very first song and was like this is amazing this is exactly what i'm teaching you to do right now because if you ever listen to part of the machine and let me wait, let me come back a little bit so by the time they did this album um well sorry i forgot to say by this album victor had left and frank arresti had taken over on guitar um and he played on this album, and by this album, um, Mark Zonder had joined the band. Mark Zonder was the, uh, uh, I think he went by Thunderchild in the band uh, Warlord. I remember having one of their albums and not thinking it was that great, and he didn't play anywhere near how he plays on here. But uh, part of the machine Starts out with a da 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 da
anyway, I'll sorry, I'll stop right now. But if you go back and like if you listen to the song and kind of know where the pattern starts over, they are switching time signatures every measure. So it'd go like so it's like a measure of seven, then a measure of four, then a measure of seven, four, and then I think it goes into the five, four, and four, four, and there's some sixes in there or whatever. There's one part where they play two measures of four, four, and you're like, what the hell was that? That was two measures of common time in a row. Then they get to the bridge of the song, and I can't even count it anymore because I don't know where the pattern starts even after what 30 years I still can't figure it out um they had a song called through different eyes which is the second track and that was the closest thing to like radio friendly stuff that they had um it was very catchy uh it was really good and still technically like uh, a well-played song, but it wasn't anywhere near that first song. But then you get Static Axe, which is back to the really proggy metal stuff. Um, and they did a lot of things with arpeggiated guitar parts on this album that were just fantastic. It was just, you listen to it, even 30 years later, I still listen to it and notice new things uh, they have a song called World Apart that ended side one originally on the cassette and the vinyl. And uh, not only is the drum part just phenomenal, but the vocals are awesome. And th at this point, um, Ray was doing vocal harmonies, but he wasn't doing tons of layers. I think he was more of uh let's put them in when necessary and um and i think the stuff felt more full live by doing that i'm not sure but um world apart is my favorite song on this album uh there's an instrumental well it's not an instrumentally fully the first like two or three minutes is in uh with vocals really mellow piano is in there i think uh kevin moore played piano from dream theater um and there was a violin player too uh it, at fate's hands is this the song that i'm talking about and uh, they did a different version called At Fate's Fingers on like a best of compilation, which was a different alternate version of the song. Uh, but the, the last two thirds of the song are instrumental. And honestly, just like Thought Industry, the Fate's Warning weren't a band that did instrumentals, but when they did an instrumental, it was just amazing it was like holy shit you know there are guys like Ingve who aren't even coming close to doing stuff this intricate this interesting or this tasteful you know um let's see what do we got the arena was one of my friend jeremy's favorite songs and when we saw him on this tour he was hoping they would play it and they never did uh vocally it's pretty difficult um, Chasing Time is a very mellow song. The drum part is one of the few drum parts of Mark Zonders that I've ever learned all the way through. Um, I'm not really big on learning other people's playing or drumming or drum parts, I should say. Um, I've never been like a covers guy, but I learned this because I was learning double stroke rolls, and if you don't know what double stroke rolls are, it's when you make one uh, motion towards uh, a drum or a hi-hat, and for every one motion like that you get, it hits, it goes. So if you, you know, you do like that. Um, so I was learning that, and he was a huge influence on my playing and I think I've said it before, same with Dustin Donaldson in Thought Industry. Um, 
Tim Alexander from Primus and the drummer from Third and the Mortal later on. Uh, uh, Chasing Time is kind of like, well, my brother John at one point said it reminded him of Kansas, like Dust in the Wind kind of stuff, uh, but a little bit more somber. Uh, this album ends with nothing left to say, and that has one of the coolest vocal parts at the very end. Kind of the, I loved the screams when I was younger, and still to this day, I'm super impressed by the range on his uh, vocal parts. Uh, he also did a demo for the song Quietus on this, and there's one part where he says as dusk engulfs the gate of horn and it's just super high and you're just like holy shit that how does he even sing that high uh nothing left to say also starts out with really crazy odd time stuff um and i have a live cassette of them on this tour and uh, Mark Zonder starts this song out with a maybe two minute at the most drum solo. And it's really interesting what he is playing. And I've never been a fan of drum solos, even though I'm a drummer. Um, and the way they went into this live was, was awesome. So I will move on. I could go on for days about how awesome, uh, perfect symmetry is so then they followed it up with parallels and parallels let me let me do something here this is the the shitty digipack thing that metal blade they made all these digipacks and they rip all the time look at look at the book because it gets stuck on the glue that they put in there so this was the album that they kind of still same lineup. They, uh, I think they tried to be more commercial on this album purposely. Uh, it was, I believe produced. Let me see who produced this thing. Yeah, this was produced by Terry Brown. And if you don't know who Terry Brown is, all you have to do is grab your copy of Rush Moving Pictures or Rush Fly By Night, and there you got him. Of course they decided to, to record with Terry Brown. He knew exactly the type of music they were playing. Um... And this, uh, here, I'm going to switch this. This album, this, this version has a live recorded, live recorded in, uh, January 2392, pre-production demos, the making of parallels. Um, and then another live out, uh, on the DVD, a live show from 92, where I believe, um, that's the that's the show that Ray Alder is uh wearing a Power Mad shirt and Power Mad were a local band from Minnesota over here. Uh it might have been on the DVD that comes with this. These are all the special editions with DVDs and whatnot. Um they started this album with like Leave the Past Behind and you can t tell they're switching gears, trying to get more commercial. Uh, I don't know if they were trying to get on the radio more, but who didn't want to get on the radio more? Uh, the high points on this are probably eye to eye. Uh, there's a bridge section that has just amazing vocal melodies. Um, 11th Hour was something that they still do play today, I believe. I don't know. They have a new live album coming out on January 23rd. Uh, 2018 so that might be in a in a new buy video that I do later um, 
We Only Say Goodbye and Don't Follow Me. I believe those are two of the first songs that Ray Alder actually wrote lyrics for. Let me... Uh, for some reason, I thought he he wrote lyrics on those songs, but maybe not. No, 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 no. This is the album that they basically said, Hey, Jim Matthews, we're going to let you take the reins and you write all the music and all the lyrics to the things. Uh, I think he, at this point, he was kind of tired with the whole, like, kind of heavy metal kind of stuff and wanted to do more melodic stuff. You know, uh, it didn't make it a didn't make it any less interesting because you still had such a great group of players that they could do just about anything that um, was asked of them. This, I'm going to throw kind of related stuff in on these discography videos. Um, this is Jim Matthews' first solo album. I don't have his second one. Uh, there was a point in my life where if I didn't listen to something very long or very much, I would sell it because you, at one point you could make money on CDs, uh, from record stores that are local and stuff. Now you can't. And I don't sell anything anymore. I just keep it and hope that one day I'll be in the mood. So this is Jim doing... Guitar, uh, acoustic guitar, and there's a cello player and a viola player, a violin player. And this was uh, such a um, connected album with me at that time in my life, at the relationship that I was in. Uh, every time I listen to it, I kind of think of that person and... Uh, you know, every once in a while, uh, I'll listen to it and not get very far through it. Um, that person is no longer with us, so I can't tell her about that or anything <laughs> about how it kind of connects. You know how sometimes you connect certain albums with people and it, kind of makes you sad that you can't talk to them anymore. Uh, it was somebody I had dated for about two and a half years, and uh, and we kind of grew apart, but I it would be still cool to be able to call her up and talk music and stuff with her, but alas, I cannot, and I'm going to move out of the, uh, the zone of sadness. Um... <laughs> Let's see, the next one, this is another reason I hate these stupid digipacks, because it's always like, which section is this album, or this booklet in? So this was another album that they did with, uh, I believe with uh, Terry Brown. Let me see. No. This was produced by Bill Metoyer, who was kind of a um, kind of a metal blade go-to producer. Uh, I believe he also produced Flotsam and Jetsam's "No Place for Disgrace," yeah, which was on Electra. And this, wow, look at that crack in my CD case. Um, that was a great album, but it was always weird when he would produce thrash because it's like you got the attack and the response on the kick. It was, it was just weird. So when people played really fast double bass, it always sounded weird to me. Sorry, I'm going to go through these a little faster. Uh, outside looking in, this is again, them kind of staying in that commercial area, but... This one moved a little bit 
back into a little bit more technicality. Uh, highlights on this for me are the Strand and Shelter Me and um, Monument. Monument actually starts in measures of seven. Uh, I think the bass goes... And Ray Alder's voice, he, he does this lower... Um, there's a blind desire, kind of really low for what he normally sang, and uh, it's just fantastic. Uh, there are harmonies that he accidentally did um, while trying things out, and then they decided to let both vocal parts play, because um, he was trying to figure out how he wanted to sing it, and then he recorded to or three, who knows, um, which multiple vocal parts. And they decided, let's just see what they sound like if you, if you play them together, because it was very different phrasing, but there were harmonies and a lot of it, and I guess a lot of it worked. And that's what you hear on the final thing. I know this because of the, uh, liner notes or, or some interview or something like that, that I read. Uh, this version comes with demos, a live disc, and a live DVD. So, and it was remastered too. The nice thing with um, Metal Blade when they do these is they do give you a lot of stuff for your money. Um, and that, of course, came out in like 94, and this version came out in 2012. Uh, in 95 came out this, which was Chasing Time. Whoops. Um, and maybe this is where, where is it? Maybe this is where I read because every song on here has a little liner note about the song and so Monument is on here. It kicks it off. Uh, there are a couple things on here that were unreleased. Um, At Fate's Fingers, which was one of those floppy discs that would come in a guitar player magazine. And that's the way they released it originally. And then they put it on this best of, which is called uh, Chasing Time, just so you know. Which is funny, because they don't actually have the song Chasing Time on here at all. Um, and then a song called Circles, which was unreleased, which used parts of, um, I think, I can't remember which, it used parts of two other songs that ended up being on other, uh, or sorry, parts of Circles became parts of two other songs. So when you listen to Circles, you're like, oh, I recognize that part. Uh, there was also an unreleased mix of We Only Say Goodbye. This is kind of for two different people. The absolute collector, the guy who has to have everything, or the girl, um, or the casual, the casual Fates Warning fan. Uh, in 98, and much to my surprise when I, uh, picked this up for the first time, I didn't even know this was coming out until the day it came out. And, uh, actually I can put that up. Pleasant Shade of Grey was, I believe, a 56 minute, uh, song. It's divided into 12 tracks and, um... Oh, sorry. There are two songs on this album where Ray finally wrote lyrics, I believe. Just train of thought here going. Uh, this was... I don't know who produced this. Let me see. Terry Brown. They got Terry Brown back for this. Um, all the lyrics in this book are just one long thing of lyrics. There's no 
nothing differentiating differentiating them of like part one part two part 12 but if you look at it it basically says part one through 12 and there is some really awesome stuff on here uh kevin moore plays keyboards um the very final um song or very final part of this is my favorite part part 12 the only downfall in this album is you cannot listen to it while going to sleep because it ends with a really loud clock alarm and nothing is more annoying than waking up when you don't have to um ray his voice was still fantastic and th at this point um he is still a great singer he just doesn't I shouldn't say fantastic at this point. I should say he still had the higher range at this point. Um, and he does some really great stuff around the end of this song, uh, the very last song, and somewhere in the middle too. Um, this was the first album that Joey Vera played bass on. And he does play, a, eh, a, I'll say it, quite a bit or a little bit of fretless bass in a couple songs, and it is fantastic because you're, you're like, wow, that it just stands out, and I love fretless bass. So, dude, 1973, I don't know if you'd like this. It might have too much bass on it. I like giving dude 1973 crap because he doesn't, he said he doesn't like bass as much, and he turns the bass down, and that is so foreign to me. So we have uh, Fate's Warning, Still Life, and this is their first live album. Uh, track, or disc one, is this album all the way through, 12 parts. And by the way, on this version of the album, you get not only two live shows on the DVD, one which they, I believe, did on the VHS that I still have. Um, but you also get the demos and the Pleasant Shade of Grey live in Europe and a soundtrack of We Only Say Goodbye. And I believe the song In Trance is by The Scorpions. Um, I haven't listened to all of the stuff on this. I don't even think this is remastered, actually. I just think they put it out in this limited edition three CD and DVD box. So this, back to this. So disc one is all of Pleasant Shade of Grey. Disc two has all of the Ivory Gated Dreams, which is that 22 minute song that I was talking about on the No Exit album. Ray pulls Ivory Gated Dreams off perfectly. It's so good. I wonder how, if they did any overdubs because his voice is fantastic on that. And that was done 10 years after the fact. Um, of course, he doesn't do a lot of the high, high, high stuff, but he still pulls off every other uh, vocal part. And luckily, he is a singer that knows when to change and alter things live instead of trying to go for it and failing. Um, there are a lot of singers who try to go for it and just, you know, they don't have it anymore. Uh, his voice is still really good. Um, anyway, let's talk about more of this. So they do the 11th hour and point of view. They do monument, which is great to hear live. Uh, and Fate's, At Fate's Hands, which is the instrumental. They do a snippet of Prelude to Ruin, but not the whole song. That's one of John Arch's songs. And I wish they just would have done the whole thing, but I get justification later because they did a reunion thing with John Arch, which I will talk about. After I breeze past the two Fate's Warning, well... First of all, they do Disconnected. Uh, Piece of Me is my favorite track on this. This was where I kind of got disenchanted with Fate's Warning for a while. Um, the songwriting wasn't quite as strong 
and I was kind of disappointed in this, but check out Piece of Me and One. Uh, those were the two standout tracks. This is still with um, oh, Frank Arresti. Sorry, Frank Arresti left uh, by the time they had done Pleasant Shade of Grey. Uh, this is just one guitarist, um, bass, drums, vocals, with probably keyboards and stuff. But he added more guitars than the number of guitarists in the band. Um, then after that came the John Arch Twist of Fate album, which is Jim Mathios. Uh, let me see here. It is only two songs. It is Relentless, which is 12 minutes and 23 seconds, and Cheyenne, which is 15 minutes and 36 seconds. And remember what I said about long songs? Mm, these don't quite hold up like they should, but... This was done in, what, 2003? And his voice is still really good, and he can still hit those high notes. Um, this has Joey Vera on bass, who is also in Fate's Warning, but he is also the bass player from Armored Saint. Um, Mike Portnoy played drums, the drummer from Dream Theater. Um, this was before he started jumping in every band side project and stuff like that or a little bit after he had started doing that um i can't remember a lot of this i sold it the original version and then i found this weird like kind of special edition with the slip case and i thought you know what it's only probably like five bucks or something like that i paid so i got that um X, uh, Fate's Warning, FWX, is another one where I was quite disenchanted at the point that it came out. I thought Mark Zonder could have been more aggressive as a drummer, done a little bit more heavy stuff when it needed to be heavy. Uh, his parts weren't quite fitting in the mix. Maybe I should listen to this again. Um, the two big... Uh, Standout tracks is Another Perfect Day and Simple Human. Uh, those are my two favorite songs. Uh, you still have Vera, Ray Alder, Jim Mathios, and Mark Zonder. Uh, I think that was it. They might have had some guests or something like that. And then after that came um, the Arch Mathios album called Sympathetic... What is it called? Sympathetic Resonance. And this was, I believe, supposed to be songs that they were working on for a Fate's Warning album, but Ray Alder has another band called... Ah, I can't even remember what the heck they're called. Um, that he was busy with. Ray Alder also did an album called Engine in the meantime, which I found used the other week and it was just kind of priced too high for a used disc um i've had it i sold it i've had it again probably um i don't remember there was a point in my life where i did the rebuy the sell and the rebuy over and over again uh this uh you have john arch on vocals jim matthews on guitars you have bobby jarzombek who played with uh, Riot for a long time, and his brother is Bobby, uh, or Ron Jarzombek, who was in Watchtower, and if you've heard that band, you know exactly what kind of craziness is going on there. Joey Vera's on bass, and then Frank Arresti did additional guitar solos. So this is almost uh, bringing back the band, or a band close to... Uh, you got three out of the five guys who were on um, Awaken the Guardian. And this is an album that I'm not 100% familiar with. Um, I can't really name any uh, standout tracks because it's been so long since I've listened to it. Uh, which is a shame because I really should. 
unfortunately, some things I kind of avoid and during these videos, I have to be truthful and, and just tell you, hey, I, uh, I'm not so familiar with them. Um, in 2000, let's see, 2013, finally after like 10 years, when was the last, yeah, nine years, uh, Fate's Warning did got together and did another album. This one has um, Frank Oresti is back in the band on this one. Uh, you have Ray Alder, Jim Matthews, Joey Vera, uh, Jarzombek, and uh, Frank Oresti on additional uh, lead guitar. Uh, my favorite two tracks on this album are falling which is a really short acoustic thing but ray's vocals are just amazing on this and firefly firefly is so catchy and so good um even if i hated every other song on this which i don't i i like a majority of it it just didn't grab me like the older stuff did I would still keep it if I was selling I would still keep it for those two tracks and this bonus version bonus this version has an extended firefly falling further um, the song one live and life in still water live so if you're gonna get it actually if you're gonna get any of these get the the extended versions uh, this is the newest one that my buddy Glenn loves, it's called Theories of Flight. And um, the light and shade of things was my favorite song on here. Um, but I'm not super familiar with this album. Uh, all these ones that I say I'm not super familiar with, I think tomorrow I will bring them to work and listen to them at the store and just kind of get reacquainted with later era fate's warning this is absolutely fantastic uh there's only one thing i find wrong with this this is awaken the guardian live and it had the the complete lineup of awaken the guardian you had joe dibiase back on bass uh he hadn't i don't think recorded or played with anybody um, like on this level since he quit Fate's Warning. Uh, Jim Mathios, Frank Arresti on guitar, and Steve Zimmerman, who honestly still holds up and still plays every part just freaking spot on. Um, the only thing I don't like about this is there are two discs, um, two different shows for the DVD and um, let's see which one was it the the version let me see if it says in here um, the version that they did for Prague power I believe it is not sure the I'm not sure which show is on the CDs but they should have put the show that is on the CDs uh, they should have put the the other show there's I, I don't know what I'm saying so they did two different shows one was in Europe one was in America the European one ends up being on the the audio discs they should have done the American one on the audio discs because John Arch's voice is so spot on with how many things that he does that he does exactly like the album. And there are parts where I'm like kind of waiting to be cringed and, and he just nails it. It's, it's awesome. You can get that show on audio discs if you download it from their Bandcamp site. I think this is uh, the whole thing is on Bandcamp, and that's the only way you can get that audio. Um, 
I mean, unless you ripped it from the DVD. But this is the second live album, and they do Awaken the Guardian all the way through, and then they also do Apparition, Damnation, Night on Brocken, Kyrie, Ele oh, uh, Kyrie Eleison, and... Oh, I already said Epitaph, so... Wait... Damnation, Apparition, Kyrie Eleison, Epitaph, and Night on Brocken with this. Uh, I was super surprised how good this was. I was I was buying it kind of reluctantly, but it is well worth the price of admission. And I will tell you about how, what I think of the live album when it comes out on the 23rd. All right. Thanks for watching.